see that there was not a match for him. And so instead of looking to himself to solve his problem, God set up a situation so that Adam would immediately go to his provider who was going to bring this help me to him. All right, and now for the next three verses, it belongs to the hands. Verse 21 to 23. Okay, so for those of you who have your Bible in front of you, from verse 23 to 21 to 23, or we can even go down to 25, what else do we learn? I think we got pulled out some really good points so, so far. But I want to continue to look at those scriptures. So what else do we learn? So, so far we know God said it wasn't good for man to be alone. So he provided the solution after he showed Adam or helped Adam see that this was a problem as well. So what else do we see in those verses? Anyone else? The other significant thing is that um, what does God do now? He took, he took when God brought him his wife. He was sleeping, right? Was Adam out here trying to play with dirt and create his wife on his own? Right, so Adam was, anybody ever had, he was in a deep sleep. Anybody ever had one of those deep sleeps and you are just content and you can feel that you're content, right? So that we can translate that to our relationships, right, as well. We can say that, you know, just as Adam was deep in sleep, he was resting in the Lord's hand, right? As the Lord was opening him up and performing that surgery, he was resting in the Lord's hand as the Lord was preparing to bring him his bride. Many of us today, the, you know, as we were discussing earlier, the, the environment that we're currently living in makes us want to go out into a rush into relationships to seek to bring about relationships on our own. But are we being patient as the example in the scriptures tell us? Are we being patient? and allowing God to bring about the relationship, the plan for our love lives that God wants to bring about. I can give a testimony on here, I can talk to you guys for hours about just how many relationships I rushed into trying to take the reins of, of my love life on my own. And it wasn't until I surrendered my love life into the hands of my Father above that I actually started to see God's plan for my life, for my heart, for, you know, for my future home. So to, to summarize what we've seen, here in the first two chapters of the Bible, we see the first relationship between man and woman. So that tells me a couple of things. First of all, it tells me that God is sovereign, that relationships would not exist without his sovereignty and his will. The second thing that tells me is that God cares about it, right? He said it's not good for Adam to be alone. I will make someone for him. Mm. So God is sovereign, God cares, and then it also tells me that no one wants our happiness more than God does. Mm. So then I have to ask, but after reading this, I have to ask myself my, the question, why would I want to ever have a love relationship without God? Without God at the helm of it, to be the one to help me figure out who it is that he wants me to be with, and to help me realize you know, how do I even approach this relationship? From right here in the beginning, we get the glimpse that God wants to be intricately involved with our love lives and with the matters of our hearts. Now the question is, are we willing to surrender that to him? Are we willing? So, where we want to transition into next is talking about the practicality of this. So we just went over God's ideal for loving relationships from the beginning, right? And now, we want to talk about how do we practically apply what we've gleaned from just these couple of verses. There's a lot more, but just these couple of verses. How do we practically apply this to our lives in this day and age in the 21st century? And so what we're going to do, we're going to walk through a couple of principles of a Christ-centered courtship. Now, this is what it's titled, but we've talked about this a lot, and we really believe that everything we're going to share, um, there's five principles. Everything we're going to share is applicable whether you're single, whether you are in a relationship that's going well, whether you're in a relationship that's going wrong, whether you're married, whether you're divorced, it doesn't matter what your circumstances, a lot of, we believe all of these principles are applicable at the basic foundation. So let's get right into it. The first principle is purpose. The purpose of courtship is for a man and woman to prayerfully 
and intentionally consider what marriage is in God's will for me. And from the very beginning, Brandon and I have always said, because we get the question a lot, well, what's the difference between courtship and dating? What's the difference? And for us, we just always said we love the word courtship because when you say it, it signifies something deeper um, and, and a deeper meaning and the purpose behind what you're doing than the word dating. For example, when I'm at work, and if I share a story about my husband and someone asks, like, oh, you know, how long have you guys been together or whatever? And I say, well, we started courting in 2013 and we got married in 2015. I can already see the wheels rolling in their head, like, why did she just say courting? Why didn't she just say dating? Or that they were together? And so I'm kind of open in a witnessing opportunity right there by just using the word courtship or courting instead of saying dating, because we can say dating and everyone has a different meaning of what that, a different interpretation of what that word means. For some people it means going out on a date. For some people it means you have multiple people that you are seeing at the same time. And so we just love the word courtship. So I just want to preface that for our presentation, we love to use this word. Um, we don't really fight over which word is right or wrong, but we just love this word because of what it signifies. And so from the very beginning, Courtship is about purpose. Someone said this in their response to the scriptures, but what we saw in the story of Genesis 2 was that God had a purpose. It was God ordained. There was a reason behind what he was doing. And we always emphasize that before entering a relationship as a man and a woman, it's very important to know why. Where is this going and what are we doing together, right? What are, what are, what are we getting into? It's important as we we'll as we'll turn to our first scripture for this topic of, of purpose, uh, if you turn with me to, book, to the book of Amos chapter 3, verse 3, looking at Amos chapter 3, verse 3, and there it reads, it says, can two walk together except they be, what? Agreed. Can two walk together except they be agreed. It's important for both people in the relationship to be in agreement about the intention and the purpose behind that relationship. Sometimes, I'll, sometimes I remember back to my days in school, and I would ask somebody about, you know, them being in a relationship with so-and-so, and they'll say, oh, well, I don't really know if we're still doing this whole thing, or what, what's going on with us, but I guess you could say we're together. It's like, that, it's like that gray area. They don't really know what's going on in their relationship. They say that they're dating, right? But they don't really mean, are they dating for a purpose? Are they dating just to casually date? Like, what is, their, what is the purpose behind their relationship? And it's important for both people, as my wife was just mentioning, both people for, to be committed to the prayerfully and purposefully investigating is marriage and God's plan for us being together. I remember back to my years of just going about and seeking out different friendships and relationships with women, and a lot of that was c consisted of wasting time. I was stealing time, as Exodus verse 20 or chapter 20 verse 15 says. I was stealing the time, the affections of someone else, just for my own selfish desires. But when you have a purpose to honor God and to seek, is 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 this relationship, you know, God's ideal for our lives? Like, does God does God want to bring us together in a covenant? I believe that you can't waste time in that space. You can't waste time if you, if both people are in agreement saying that we are purposefully and, um, and um, what is the word, purposefully and prayerfully seeking to know God's will for our love lives. And as Brandon talked about stealing affections, I don't know how, you know, other women in this room, but nothing was more irritating for me than trying to guess if a guy was interested in me or not, or if we would be out and he would, you know, we'd be around friends and he wouldn't be afraid to say, like, this is my, you know, girlfriend. There's nothing more annoying and that tug with my heart than leaving it up in the air and feeling like, well, here I am investing time and talking to you and you are, you know, talking about all these things to me in private, but when we get in public, there's no acknowledgement of what you're trying to do. And so, you know, in a Christ-centered courtship, and everything is about seeking the will of God. Putting the purpose first, you know, when I study the life, the life of Christ on this earth, he was very clear about his purpose from the beginning. Everything he did, he established, he confirmed why he was here and what he was here to do. And if my Heavenly Father is about setting purpose and making it clear, then we should be the same in how we approach one another 
in our relationships as Christians. We should be clear, like, you know, and, and, and just as an example, but a young man, you know, approached woman that I have been praying about this and I have been seeing you in you know, Sabbath school or in divine worship. And, you know, it's really been laid on my heart that I want to get to know you more to see if marriage would be in God's will for us. Of course, there's a whole lot more context to that. We, we could share about it, but there's nothing more than saying up front what you, what you want and what you intend to do. And so um, that's why we start out with purpose as a, as a foundation. And ladies, if a man does not know the purpose behind the relationship that he's trying to have with you, walk the other way. He's saying this as a big brother. Walk, walk the other way. If a man cannot clearly identify the purpose behind the relations that he wants to have with you, turn away. I've had this experience most recently with my, my younger sister. She was uh, involved with a, a, a young man in the past, maybe about a year or so ago, and I, I was trying to get an answer out of him for what he wanted out of the relationship. He could never give her a clear answer. I said, why are you still with him? You watch our YouTube channel, why are you still with him? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but to God be the glory, she woke up from that, and now she's actually in a um, in the beginning stages of the, you know, developing a courtship with a young man, and I've had conversations with him by God's grace, and he's clearly identified his intentions to me, um, and I, you know, I trust that you know, God has done a work in her heart to show her why it's so important for the man that you know, is seeking to have a relationship, seeking to lead you in a relationship, for him to know his intentions and his purpose from the onset. And one last scripture on this that I wanted to read as well is Proverbs 3, verse uh, five to seven, trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, and sorry, be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. And so these scriptures just remind me it's important to put our trust in God to reveal to us his will. It's not about what I want, it's about what God wants it. Even when we went on YouTube with our first video, we said, hey, you know, we're still praying whether God, marriage is in God's will for us. And these videos will stay up there if we don't end up getting married. But what we want is God's will to be done. The last thing I wanted to do was be married to someone that God did not ever intend for me to be married to. So that's purpose. And men, I'm oh sorry, I addressed the women earlier. I didn't get to address the men. Men, stop playing with the hearts of our sisters. <laughs> we have to stop. If we, if we say that we have the love of God living in our hearts, then who are we to steal the time, the affections, the, you know, have you gone to her parents and asked if you can court her? If you can seek to know if marriage is in God's plan? This is somebody who's been raising this person and uh, caring for them for all their lives. And have you sought them for their counsel or for their, you know, um, acceptance of you seeking to know if God's, if God's will is for marriage? This is important for us because as brothers and sisters, we have to have these very candid discussions about how to approach relationships. And I can't hold back from, the, from uh, honing in on this for the men and also for the women. Are we good? Amen, yes. I think we stretched that one out. <laughs> All right, great. So principle number two, preparation. Preparation. Uh, how many of us have ever taken a test in school? Anybody, anybody ever taken a test? Nobody ever went to school? Right. Or for so, work. <laughs> or for work. Now imagine taking a test of the greatest magnitude. Your teacher has told you from the onset that this test you want to study for, you want to prepare for, you want to go into this test knowing as much material as possible because it will be a closed book. No notes. Now, which of us, who of us in this room would choose, would intentionally choose not to study for that test. Anybody in this room? I don't see a single hand raised. Well, we have to adapt that example to the situation of, to the, to the circumstance of a, of a marriage. Let's look at Ephesians 5. Let's look at Ephesians 5, chapter, uh, yeah, Ephesians 5, verse 31, beginning at verse 31. And we'll read from there, saying that for this cause, Shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Here's where we're going, 30, verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. 
we have to understand the magnitude of the marriage relationship that we're seeking after, right? Because we're, we're past the purpose now. We understand that our purpose is to prayerfully and purposefully seek to know if God's will is for marriage, right? So we're past this purpose part. Now we're on to preparation. If we know the magnitude of, this, of, the, of, the, of the marriage that we're seeking, God tells us in his word what this marriage is to represent the relationship between Christ and the church. Knowing that magnitude, who would, what, what, who would we be to not purposefully prepare ourselves for that relationship? To not purposefully prepare ourselves for that relationship? We must be intentional in understanding what are we even getting into? What are we even getting into? What is the role of a husband in the home? What is the role of a wife in the home? Who do I need to be as a potential, as a future father to my children, as a mother? to my future children. Christ tells us a perfect example. Show you one The example of the yes. loop. So in Luke chapter 14, where Christ is uh, talking about following him, becoming his disciple, um, he says something very important in uh, verse 28. He says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sit it not down first and count it the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? And I remember when we were engaged and we went to a marriage ministry event at a church. And I remember we were sharing that we were engaged and we were gonna get married. And one of the elders leaned over to us and said, have you counted the cost? <laughs> and we kind of were just like taken aback by that question. Not because we were prepared, weren't prepared to answer, but no one ever, you know, in response to us sharing that we were engaged, asked us that question. It was usually, oh, congrats, what's the wedding? He was like, have you counted the cost? <laughs> what you're about to do. Have you seriously considered whether or not you are ready to be with this person for the rest of your life? And that's what preparation is about. You are sitting down and you are counting. What am I getting into? What am I even signing up for by saying I want to be in a relationship? One of the toughest pills that I had to swallow when I was coming out of my worldly understanding of relationships was someone said to me, you shouldn't be in a relationship if you're not ready to get married. And I was like, hmm? What do you mean? And I had to really marinate and sit and sit on that one because essentially they were saying the purpose of relationships is marriage. I mean, you don't really see anything else in the Bible outside of marriage. You don't just see dating or courting relationships. And so they were saying to me, if you don't even feel ready to be married, then why are you even in a relationship? What are you doing? And so for us, what preparation is about is really considering that thought. What am I doing? You know, what 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 am I, you know, signing up for and getting into? Companionship is great. You know, God wants us to have companionship, but that's just, that's not the only thing in a relationship. Like, I really learned um, how much ugliness I had inside of me through our courtship. It's through that iron sharpening iron process that I learned more about myself and my character. And we have, if, if, if you're saying you want to be in a relationship and you want to be married one day, we have to be willing in maturity, in spiritual maturity, to say, you know, this is ugly about myself. You know, I see the way that, how I speak to him hurts him. And I see how it can be very disrespectful. And I need to go to Christ to fix that in me. That, that, that's a part of relationships. Are we ready to do that, you know? When you're single, you don't have to, you don't have to deal with somebody telling you about yourself in that way. You still do, but not in that way, in that close, intimate way where it really bothers you. And you know, as a wife and, and as a husband, are you ready for that? Really want to drive Amen. And then going back to the scripture that Sharetta touched on earlier from the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, verses 24, where it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. I was reading this the other day, and I was like, wow. Scripture says, Therefore shall a man. It doesn't say, Therefore shall a child. It says, Therefore shall a man. Do you, men, do you understand what it means to be a man? To be seeking after a, a woman in a relationship. You know that you want to purpose for for marriage you know and I, in my time of study I, I learned that to be a man is to know your identity is to know your purpose and is to know your authority you have to be able to understand the calling that God has placed on you on a future as, as a future priest of your home and in this time of preparation we need to be burying ourselves in the word taking our time to pray without ceasing sister white says that when you are investigating the possibility of marriage, 
you ought to be praying, what is it, four times as much as you would occasionally be praying. Four times as much. We need to be commit, committing ourselves to careful prayer, to thoughtful study of the Word, to know what is the calling over my life as a future you know, husband or as a future wife or a mother or a father. God indeed wants to give us a marriage that is pure, a marriage that is holy, that is reverent, that is enjoyable. But we have to take time to prepare ourselves to make sure that we are ready for that covenant, ready for that commitment. You know, I'm sure that many in this room today might be also in the same condition that, you know, people around the world are, where you're hurting, where you're carrying around baggage from your past, where you've been in damaged relationships in, in your past, and you're, you know, still having gotten the victory over some of those sins or some of those transgressions that keep you ground, I mean, that keep you bound to the things of this world. But God wants to give you the victory so that you can fully embrace the beauty of a purpose-filled courtship, the beauty of a godly marriage. I'm passionate about the subject of healing and of brokenness because I know what it feels like, you know, and I know what it's like to go from day to day and to not have any hope, not, not to have any, any love in your heart because you're constantly being burdened by mistakes that you might have made from the past. But it's important for our time of preparation to take these burdens before the Lord. It says, come unto me. All ye that are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God has indeed a plan in place for us, for our hearts, for our love lives, if we indeed just take it to Him. Yes, and definitely on that point of addressing uh, hurt or brokenness from the past, it's so, so important. Um, there are so many things that came out of our premarital counseling sessions that we really needed to talk about and address before entering marriage, or else it would rise up as problems. And so facing, you know, things we may have been through in the past, you know, for me, the big one was acknowledging what type of effect did divorce have on me, my parents' divorce have on me. Those type of things are very important in moving forward and in preparing as well. And so, but, you know, we can spend a whole week, we have a whole presentation on, on healing and brokenness, and, and especially so how it resonated with the people in Cuba, but um, this is just so important to keep in mind as well. You want to you want Christ to heal you, and you want to be whole um, as you're preparing for relationship or marriage. Right, because the word says two shall become one flesh. So you're not so. So when when you're two, it means that you are whole. When you're one, you are whole in Christ, and wholeness in Christ comes about addressing those areas of brokenness from your past and your life. So let's move on. We have purpose. We have preparation. What's next? Service. The foundation of any loving relationship is serving another. Um, there's this thing that I'd love to say. You know, Christian relationships is really an opportunity to respond to God's grace towards us. I'm going to let that sit for a moment. A relationship is an opportunity for us to respond to God's grace towards us. Because I'm just going to start with the first scripture that we all know, right? We can probably say this from the top of our head. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Right here, we see what demonstrating love really looks like. It looks like God sending his Son to die for us, to serve us. And so, one of the biggest things I've learned about a true loving relationship is that you are the person's holiness, the person's growth and relationship with Christ is of the utmost importance to you. Courtship and relationships is not about fulfilling your own selfish desires or your own emotional needs. You know, I want someone to study with, or I want this, or I want that. No, it's about being genuinely interested in the well being of the other person and being willing to let God use you to serve that person. When we realize what God has done for us and how much grace he's bestowed on us, now I can look to the other person and say, here's an opportunity for me to show compassion, to show kindness, to show love, to show all of these wonderful things. Um, what, and another thing I wanna add as well is, in, especially in a marriage relationship, there are things that I see about Brandon that none of you and no one else will ever see. No. And it's my responsibility as his wife to take those things in prayer before God. If I'm selfish, if I'm only concerned about myself, 
I'm not going to be aware of his spiritual needs and how to intercede for him before God. And so it's so, so important to understand this aspect of service and relationship because it's not about me. And, and no, you know, marriage ultimately is also about, ultimately about God. And when people see us, they should see Christ in the church. They should be reminded of God's love for us. And so this aspect of service is so crucial to really having a relationship that's centered around God. Amen. And God's word indeed confirms this. You know, if you look at John 13, verses 34 through 35, John 13, verses 34 through 35, it says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. So as so as those, as, as, as those who are observing your relationship see the loving service that you and your significant other are actively living out in your courtship, in your engagement, and even in your marriage, that's a witness for the gospel of Christ. That is a witness for God, as we've already covered that marriage is that relationship pointing to the marriage between Christ and the church. It is a light in this dark world. God, and people around us will notice the difference when we are doing relationships God's way. I'm telling you tonight that it is not easy. You know, I've come from relationships where I was only seeking to serve myself. I was, self I was selfish in those relationships. And I knew the difference when I got in a relationship with my wife. I was like, wow, this is different. This is weird. I'm, 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 seeking, I'm, not, I'm not here to, you know, gratify myself or, you know, gratify, because, because the Lord is showing me myself in all these scriptures. And he's like, come before me, bow before me, you know, uh, consecrate yourself before me so I can renew your heart. And all, all these changes that he's doing in my life, and at the same time, he's calling me to serve my significant other, to pray for her, to ask her, how, what are some areas that you're struggling with where I can, where I can pray for you? How can I encourage you in some of the victories that you're trying to get in your own life? This is loving service in our relationship. This is seeking not to please our own, like my wife mentioned, not to please our own needs, our own selfish desires, but to surrender those to the Lord and say, Father, guide me to how I can be a blessing to this person, right? Because at the end of the day, even if this relationship does not lead to marriage, even if, even if this courtship does not lead to marriage, won't it be a wonderful testimony if that person can still say that the relationship was a blessing? That I, that I felt, you know, edified by my relationship with so-and-so. That, you know, he had a genuine interest in, you know, my walk with Christ and he prayed for me and I know that he was seeking to encourage me and, you know, whatever stage you might be in your life, wouldn't it be a blessing to say that? I mean, I believe that, and I believe that that's what God desires for us, that even if the relationship does not lead to marriage, want to be a blessing to still say that I was edified by that relationship. And I would also definitely stress that this begins in singleness, for sure. That we have to know, even if you don't have a significant other or a husband or a wife, how are you serving others? How are you meeting the needs of other people in your community, in your church? You know, are there people who are sick and shut in that you can visit and go sing a song with or pray with? Like, how are we looking to serve others around us? Um, is so, so important to building that foundation for being able to then do that and be prepared to do that in a marriage relationship. Amen. Amen. So we're done with purpose and preparation and service now. So let us move on to our fourth principle here. Boundaries. Let me turn my back to you all. Sorry. But preserving the purity of the marriage you desire begins with setting proper boundaries. God is interested in the physical, emotional, and the spiritual purity of all of his children. But in the toxic world that we're living in today, if we do not have proper boundaries in these areas of our lives, then we're not gonna be able to stand. We need to make sure that we are praying before the Lord, to going before him and asking, saying, Father, help me to set proper boundaries in my life so that I preserve myself as a pure man or as a pure woman of God. Let's turn to the word and let's see this in the word. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Hebrews chapter 13. In verse 4, where it says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, 
for whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So the Lord says here that marriage is on the marriage bed is undivided. We're speaking specifically the, uh, about the, the physical boundaries right now. Maybe my wife can also touch on the emotional boundaries, but the physical boundaries that are needed in our time of singleness, even in our time in our time of courtship, engagement, and even in our time of marriage. It says the marriage bed is undefiled. It's to say that God has reserved the marriage bed for what? For intimacy in marriage, right? But if we are going to the marriage bed prior to joining in some, joining somebody in marriage, then what are we doing? Are we, are we defiling that bed? If, we're, if, we're, if we are committing, if we are, going, if we are intimate acts with others prior to marriage, on the bed, on the marriage bed, prior to marriage, we are defiling that bed. But God's word says that marriage is honorable above all, and the bed is undefiled. So we have to make sure that in our time of singleness, we are setting proper boundaries for us to say, how can I walk as straight of a line as possible by God's strength? Just, so, just to emphasize on that scripture as well, would you go into your bed? Would you go into your bed if you had dirt on your feet from outside? Would anyone do that? No, why not? You don't want to get your bed dirty, right? All right. What about some clothes that you may have been on a construction site or something, and your clothes are have paint and everything on them? Would you get in your bed? No, you're gonna clean yourself up and get in your bed first, right? And so it's kind of the same thing. Like we don't want the marriage bed to be dirty and defiled with things from our past because we've opened up ourselves to things that we shouldn't be doing outside of the marriage context. So it's important in our time of singleness to say, what are the boundaries that I need to keep myself on the straight and narrow pathway? I know for myself it was easy, it was, it was, it was simple for me if I looked at the ways that I had fallen in the past and I said, what would have been the step that I can identify in my life that would have prevented me from going down that pathway? Was it deleting that person's phone number from my phone? Was it setting up a block on the websites that I visit, you know, on my computer? What is that proper boundary that we need to set in our time of singleness? You know, am I, am I not going to spend time late at night? We did a, um, a video on, on setting boundaries before me, asked some of our friends, you know, what are some boundaries that you have for yourself in your, you know, in your singleness and in your relationship? And one of them said, you know, I don't stay up late at night watching movies with someone of the opposite sex. Or I don't go, you know, I don't drive somebody home alone in my car, you know, w without having somebody else in the car with us, so that I don't, you know, feel tempted to go in that direction with, or to, you know, make do it, make an advance at that person that would be inappropriate, right? So we have to investigate what are the proper boundaries that we need to set in our lives so that we guard the purity of the marriage relationship that we are seeking. Yeah, and I remember when we set up our boundaries in our courtship, but some people said like, well, that's extreme, like you're doing a lot, right? And some people can say that in response to you, like, really? You're not, that's, that's not gonna hurt, like you're really not gonna do that, but no, we have to take purity so seriously that we do not mind if people think that it's strange. It's okay to, as a Christian to be strange. God tells us we should be peculiar, so it's okay. Um, but one of the favorite things we used to love to say, well, purity, it's about the presence of God more than it is the absence of the things that we're not doing. Because a lot of people try to look at purity like, well, you can't, you can't, you can't, you're not, you're not, you're not. No, purity is more about God. You know, it's about saying that I acknowledge God's presence in my relationship and I won't go in his presence and do something that would defile that. First Corinthians, no, First Corinthians um, 6, we have it up here. First Corinthians 6, verses 18 to 20 talks about fleeing fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committed fornication sinned against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We do not belong to each other. We shouldn't take liberty, especially if we're not married, which is the only relation in which God sanctifies physical intimacy. We shouldn't take the liberty to physically take advantage of someone else who belongs to God. He belongs to God. God purchased him with his precious blood. And so we have to keep that in mind in our relationship, setting boundaries to say, look, if we don't have this in place, this is what could potentially happen, and I don't even want to entertain that. Amen. And I love the way my wife just said that. Because purity really 
literally is saying, I'm so in love with Jesus that I don't want to do this. I don't, I don't want to put myself in a situation where I might possibly sin against my Heavenly Father who loves me, who cares for me, who wants the plan to work out for me in His, in his time, in my love life. And I think about the example of, um, was it, it was Joseph. Right? It was Joseph who fled from the appearance of evil. Joseph, as he, was, as he was there being tempted by Potiphar's wife, he said, how then can I sin and do this great wickedness before God? He was so consumed in his love for God that he refused to do this act with um, Potiphar's wife. So that's why it's important for us to, like my wife was saying, flee from every appearance of evil and to purpose in our hearts even before we're tempted with that situation to set proper boundaries. And one more important thing on this particular topic that I always want to share is restoration and forgiveness. Because as we've shared, we both have past where we made choices and we made mistakes and we did things that were not within the will of God. But we thank Him because He can restore and He wants to forgive. And so Amen. we come to Him confessing, Lord, I'm in this relationship and I haven't done things right. And we, we may feel guilty, and that's what Satan wants us to do. To feel so guilty that we don't even want to go before God. But if we come to him and acknowledge, Lord, I have done wrong, and I want to turn away and walk in this new way, he has already promised to forgive us and to give us what we need to now move forward in a new way. You know, when we were recording, although we set up our boundaries in the beginning, the one boundary we didn't set was kissing. We were both like, oh, you know, we don't really think it would be an issue. And so we kissed throughout the first couple months of our relationship. But we noticed as time went on that the kissing would get more intense, more intense, more intense, to where it got to a point where, well, it's kind of like how far can we go without really going across the line and you know breaking our other boundaries. And I remember I started to feel really wrong about it, but I wasn't sure how to bring it up to Brandon. And it just so happened that I was going to study abroad in um, Europe for three months for school. And so there was a natural physical separation there. And while, while I was away, you know, I was really praying about it because it was really resting on my mind. I was like, I don't, I, I don't know where marriage is, but we can't keep kissing like this because, you know, it's getting intense. And it, <laughs> without me saying anything, one day we were talking and Brandon brought up, he was like, you know what, I've been thinking about how we've been kissing, and I was like, <laughs> I didn't even say anything. I said it to God. I said, Lord, I don't know how to bring this up, but I'm really uncomfortable with it. And he brought it up, and he was like, you know what, I mean, I don't think, like, I'm preserving your purity in the way that we're kissing. And I was just like, wow. Like, I, without me saying anything, he was on the same exact page about me. That's only the Holy Spirit. And so we were like, you know what, we're not going to kiss until our wedding day. Yeah. Um, it was a very difficult decision to make. We weren't even seeing each other. So when I did come back, we saw each other. It was like, hey, hey. it really felt awkward. Because now we, I mean, and I, when I, I don't know how to describe it, but I always tell this story. And I'm like, when I saw Brandon for the first time again after we had made that decision, it was like I was forced to see him more in a spiritual way because I wasn't immediately jumping on his face. And it was just so transformed. I'm being real. It was just so transformed. 